Hey, this is Dr. Emily Sterning with AR, and I'd like to say hello to all our friends in West Virginia. This forecast marks the final video for the 50 States Project. It's been an incredible learning adventure this past year. And I'm happy to say that as we close out the project with this beautiful state in West Virginia, we're dealing with some challenges for sure. But overall, it's a pretty balanced outlook. A lot of regional variation in the state. So let's get going, get you what you need right where you are. Our biggest challenge for West Virginia's climate outlook isn't heat, it's water. Well, you're looking at some changes in seasonality and milder winters, as we'll see later. Those temperature changes are not bad relative to the rest of the nation. So let's focus in on precipitation. This state already has a regular rainfall. Sometimes it's very wet, sometimes it's very dry. And that irregularity in the rain, that drought deluge pattern is predicted to really step up as we move towards mid-century. Let's look at some of the patterns we expect to see. So overall, there's a general increase in rain predicted, about five to 10% annual increase. But I'm gonna show you on some federal figures. We by and large are just looking at trends per every season, not necessarily statistical significance. So there's a lot of uh, wild cards in there. We're gonna check it out starting with winter precipitation. So on this map for mid-century projected changes in winter precipitation, let's keep focus down here. We can see that we're in the 10 to 15% category, but that except for this extreme Western edge of the state, that, which has a little of this cross hatching marking statistical significance, just a general trend. You shouldn't bet on it for any part of the state except for here in any given particular year. When we look over at spring, we see a little bit more statistical significance, both on the western and the eastern edge. Here we start to hit a little bit into the top of the Monongahela, right? So a little bit extra spring precipitation, that can be a challenge as well as an opportunity. Sometimes that makes it harder to get crops in in the spring, but it's better than uh, much of the west, right? Where we're looking at a consistent decrease in water. We can see that the northern half of West Virginia is looking at a 10 to 15% increase in spring precipitation. And down here in the southern half, a more of a five to 10. And then we're gonna check out the summer too. In West Virginia, we're actually looking at a slight decrease trend over here by Charleston, over in the most populous western edge of the state. In the eastern side of the state, you're not looking at as much of a drying trend but you're not looking at significant upticks in precipitation either. Talking about the weather trends as we move towards mid-century in the summer to fall, I wanna alert you to the possibility of extremely large, unusual, low probability storms. Now, West Virginia is not what we normally think of as like a hurricane hotspot yet, but I'm gonna pull up this hurricane map and I'm gonna show you why. So right now we have very little yearly trend under either of the major hurricane models showing hurricane activity in the eastern seaboard, right? Showing it inland hurricane activity. I want you to check out this. Under both hurricane models, we're looking at more highly conserved tracks of hurricane activity going up inland in the U.S., and we're not just talking about like a remnant. Like in 2020 at my place in Iowa, we had a hurricane remnant move up the Mississippi River and it dumped rain on my place for three days, driving rain. Almost, it was a pretty scary time for the foundation, honestly. Here, we're not just talking about hurricane remnants either. I want you to look at the key. We're talking about actual Cat 1 hurricanes cruising up inland until uh, the southern edge of Pennsylvania, when they'll turn into tropical storms and then remnants. So this is not like a normal thing we think about for West Virginia, but we know West Virginia is vulnerable to flooding when we get big storms. As we move past mid-century, as we move towards the end of the 21st century, there is an increased possibility of dealing with hurricane level rainstorms, multiple day rainstorm events. And that's, it's pretty wild and it's pretty serious. As you think about building your resilience and your community's resilience, you gotta think about defense against flooding, knowing that that's the level of threat that you really need to be prepared for. With rain being likely to remain irregular throughout the year in the region, so you're gonna have bigger droughts as well as this potential for deluge, 
You're going to want to think about water storage too, but particularly in mountainous areas. The floods are the real danger. That's your really life threatening disaster that's going to become more likely as we move to and beyond mid century. We've already seen deadly floods in West Virginia. You know, we can take a minute, we can remember those devastating deadly flash floods in 2016. That was horrible, very painful for communities. And just this year in, in Hazard, in those terrible deadly floods in Kentucky, we're still recovering from them. There are people who will never recover. Those are the types of floods for which all of West Virginia needs to prepare. On an individual level, awareness, basic preparedness, they can save lives, you and your family's lives. Building resilience in your area could mean working to get berms up in areas around the creeks, especially with that increased spring precipitation where the creeks are already vulnerable to erosion and increasing structural stability around houses that might be in the floodplain. If your house is in a floodplain, you wanna get it lifted up if you're at risk. As a basic home level precaution, you can make sure you have backup access to power and safe drinking water in case a bad flood comes. There are a lot of steps you can take to increase your resilience and you can start small. On a personal level, very basic, you can get a backup battery charger for your phone and a life straw and keep them in a go bag. On a community level, many of the most vulnerable communities in West Virginia are small communities where people already know each other. The more you can work together, think about the right plan for your small watershed, your very local watershed, the more resilient your community will be if the floods come. The odds of them coming to your community will be increasing as we approach mid-century. Now let's take a few minutes and talk about the seasons. There are some changes projected by mid-century. Let's start by looking at the winters. And we're gonna do that through the lens of plant hardiness zones. We're using the USDA plant hardiness zone viewer. I have a tutorial for this on the channel. If you wanna dig deep, get looking right where your town is. You can see where we are right now with plant hardiness zones based on historical data from the 80s to 2009. We can see that Charleston, a lot of our very populated pocket of West Virginia here is currently in zone seven, much of the state in zone six and up at the peaks in the Monongahela, we're in zone five. Let's look over at what's projected for mid-century under the RCP 4.5 scenario, which is a moderate reduced emissions scenario, kind of a market-driven reduced emissions scenario. It's not meeting the Paris Accords, but it's where I think we're likely to go in terms of emissions for climate change. And we can see that there are some pretty significant changes, but it's not as bad as we see in some states. We see that there's gonna be a big expansion of the zone seven area. We're gonna lose the zone five peaks, which is gonna be potentially very bad for the red spruce forests up in those very protected pockets. But we see good zone six continuity in many of our uh, most forested areas that continuation of winter chill is going to be very important for avoiding tree death and wildfire. So this is a pretty good news map. Let's look again. So we're going to have conservation of forested areas here in the west and here in the east. We're going to look at it one more time. All right. You can see that this whole area here around that nice large valley where Charleston is based is going to in some ways be more appealing for people as the winters become mild. On that same note, it uh, is also predicted by all of the models that those really intense winter cold snaps where like you don't want to go outside for a week are going to become less frequent as we move towards mid-century. So this is good news in terms of your heating needs. Let's see what we would expect as we're moving into the spring though. There's some evidence that we're going to have a little bit of an earlier spring to go with those milder winters, but not so dramatically early, like we might see in uh, some parts of the nation down in the southeast, there's some places where spring is going to come like a month earlier. That messes everything up. It changes your whole picture. In West Virginia, this lighter color is about a week. This darker color is getting more into two weeks. You can see county by county where you expect the spring freeze to come one or two weeks earlier. The first fall freeze is not expected to change dramatically, maybe a few days later, up to a week later in these counties. And again, if you download this federal report, the National Climate Assessment, you can zoom in on this figure and get that sub-county data for exactly where you live, how much longer you expect the freeze-free period to be right in your area. Overall, for West Virginia, we're talking about 
maybe two or three weeks longer freeze free period, which is not bad. You know, that's a long enough one to give you a new, another couple of weeks of harvest and growth, but it's not long enough to change your whole picture. That sort of moderate change is the kind of change you can get on top of, right? So that's not so bad. Looking at the summer, looking at increase in duration of summer heat, this I'm afraid is where we have a little bit of bad news for many parts of West Virginia. Over here, we're looking at the USDA heat zone map, again, based on historical data from the 80s to 2009. And you can see that the colors here represent the typical number of days over 86 degrees. So our most populated part of West Virginia historically has seen maybe as many as 60 days over 86. And up in the mountains here, particularly in the Eastern mountains, we expect very few. We expect um, maybe one, maybe two, right? So look over here, we're going to look at mid-century under RCP 4.5 and see how it changes. And we do see dramatic changes. We used to see maybe 60 days around Charleston. We're looking at a potential doubling of up to 120 days a year. There is some real hope though. You see, those are the highest peaks, right? We can see that the peaks are having some good summer conservation of the cool and that that is extending fairly well down the foothills. We're looking at many places that have historically had cool summers at some increase, looking at Beckley. Beckley used to see maybe a couple of weeks over 86. Now we're talking about maybe a month and a half over 86. This is not as bad as the heat up that we've seen in the Western mountains and some of the Western forests like in California where there's the mass tree death. I'm not gonna say that this is a happy picture here. We're talking about a substantial increase in duration of days over 86, but I think that it's worth feeling some hope, some sense of gratitude as we look at this map, that, that the Monongahela, where most of this band here, we saw conservation of the zone six winter and we're seeing conservation of the summer cool. That means that that forest, that national forest is one where there's hope. And let me tell you, there isn't hope for all of them. And that's been one of the most heartbreaking things that I've been learning through my work here. You know, every step, we take towards getting emissions down. And we're talking about moderate reductions in the scenario we're modeling. That RCP 4.5 pathway, it's a step directly towards saving West Virginia's beautiful forests. There's places in our country we can't save them. Wayne National Forest across the border in Ohio, I drove through there this summer, it's dying already. You can see the death on it, on multiple species of trees that it's just gotten too hot for them. That's a national forest that can't be saved. But these maps we were just looking at, these USDA key and plant hardiness zones maps, I had them in my mind as my family took the 35 into your state and picked up the 64. We took it all the way through. You can see the changes on the ground in forest health pretty quick when you first hit West Virginia from Ohio. And as you go east through the state, you can feel the increasingly vigorous health of the ecosystem, the increasingly vigorous health due to the preservation and you saw in these figures, there's hope as we move towards 2050 of relative preservation in West Virginia. The Monongahela, we're looking at a forest there that could live uh, in which future generations can marvel at all of its richness. As I've been doing the research for West Virginia's climate outlook, I've been particularly struck by how many rare and wonderful plant communities you host. It's worth saying again, even with this decent conservation outlook, particularly for your Eastern forests, we are likely to see some population shift. The highest elevation parts of those Eastern forests, those red spruce forests, they're vulnerable. We, we already know that. They're in such a limited range, they've got nowhere up to go. There are many plant communities, your slightly lower elevation plant communities that are gonna be fine in this outlook, they're gonna move up the mountain. We are talking about change, right? And change is sad sometimes, but we're not talking in this area about any kind of loss of the burgeoning life, the burgeoning rich ecosystems, the medicinal plants. That kind of thing is what we have seen though. We have seen loss of life in many parts of the West. Sadly in the West, those losses will continue. When I think about relative change in a national picture, the mountains and forests of West Virginia are looking pretty good. Here's what I'm gonna say as we sort of sum up the state's climate outlook. 
If you're one of those toughies who's already dug in in West Virginia, I don't think anything was going to get you out of your place anyway, right? And I'm sure this forecast does not alarm you. This forecast, it doesn't alarm me. It just tells me things we need to do to get prepared. The increased potential for serious floods, deadly floods, particularly with the projected change in hurricane tracks, ought to be at the top of every community's list of priorities as we prepare for the future. And depending on where you are, you can see there's going to be a real need for air conditioning where maybe you didn't use it much before. In Charleston, especially, those summers are going to feel very different. In much of the western part of the state, you're going to have increased summer power needs. But as I said earlier, that's going to be kind of offset by your reduced need for winter cooling as the winters become milder with far fewer really cold streaks. Overall, this is one of the rare states where we're likely to come out about neutral on total power consumption over the course of the year, but you want to prepare for the transition in seasonal use. That's going to be an adjustment. In the western part of the state in particular, where there's more existing housing, I would prepare for people wanting to move into the state, particularly from Kentucky, which has a much more challenging outlook. They are looking at wildfire. Every way that you are getting kind of whacked in West Virginia, Kentucky's getting whacked harder. It's going to be hotter in Kentucky than West Virginia with much more chance of dangerous windstorms, much more chance of mass tree death and wildfire. In terms of overall population movement, I think you're going to see more people coming into West Virginia than going out. If you are in a small community, particularly in the east with that fairly stable outlook, your community should think about what kind of future you want. If you want to grow or if you want to stay the size you are, and you should plan for that future, set up zoning for that future. In my area, in the Midwest, some towns are preparing to grow and some towns have set hard borders. No new construction, they've decided to preserve their habitat margins and their character. These are important decisions to make with your community, conversations to have with your community so you can create the future you want. On the whole, I think we're looking at a balanced outlook. This is definitely a future with hope for West Virginia good chance of growth in the western part of the state, even though it will get hot in the summer. A nice conservation, both winter and summer, and the eastern part of the state up in the mountains. Many of the landscapes there, they're gonna look just about the same for the next generation. You take care of your land in those mountains, that land is gonna take care of you. This is Dr. Sherning with AR signing out. Please like and subscribe, help get the message out there. There is hope. We can prepare for what's coming. Let's get ready.